everybody. All right. Sweet. All right. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And this is part four of our look at the Akshayamati Bodhisattva Sutra. Um, we've been working on the sutra now for three sessions. This is our fourth. Um, but in case you maybe didn't catch some of those, never fear. Definitely today, tonight, I'm going to kind of remind us what's going on here. I actually want to do a quick recap of the 10 paramitas. That's sort of the, uh, I wouldn't say it's actually the focus of the sutra. It's the focus of this uh, section of the sutra. Um, the whole sutra actually is about this idea of bodhicitta, the mind of enlightenment, how to develop a, an enlightened mind. That is what our bodhisattva here, Akshayamati, uh, bodhisattva, inexhaustible wisdom, inexhaustible intellect. He has asked the Buddha this profound question of how, how does a bodhisattva develop a mind of enlightenment? And part one of this basically was the Buddha giving a a beautiful recitation of basically a, a gatha, what would be called a gatha, a poem, in which he says, well, to develop the mind of enlightenment, the bodhisattva cultivates, develops, generates, initiates these 10 paramitas, practices, um, uh, perfections, I guess, is sort of the, the normal term or a normal way to translate this idea of paramita. Uh, again, if you're confused about paramita, please see part one, two, and three. We kind of went over these, but I want to go over them again. I kind of want to recontextualize these ideas a little bit. And then we're, we're going to do a deep dive tonight on the the paramita of kashanti, the practice of patience, patient endurance, uh, tolerance, patient tolerance. There's a lot of different ways to translate this, uh, the Sanskrit term kashanti. And I wanna get a little bit into the Chinese term that we're working with because the sutra that we're reading, the version that we're reading was originally kind of uh, is from the Chinese. It's a translation from Sanskrit. I don't believe we have a Sanskrit version of this sutra. We might. I don't have it on me. And so we're working from um, the Chinese version. And of course, as always, we're referring to the English translation version here in a treasury of Mahayana sutras edited by Chang. Uh, yep, Chang. So, I wanted to quickly remind us, like, what are these paramitas? Like, what's going on here? These, of course, are the 10 paramitas. And if you refer to last week's class, I had sort of all 10 tens written on the board last time. And that's right, for each of the 10 paramitas, this sutra is about to give us 10 practices, making a, a grand total of a hundred different practices of the Bodhisattva to develop this mind of enlightenment. And right off the top, I want to say, you know, if anybody's out there, um, you know, like really taking a list of all of these, I'd like you to pull back a second. <laughs> Because the idea here is, is that this, this number 10 in, in uh, Mahayana Buddhism, we're kind of referencing the 10 directions, uh, the ordinal, the cardinal directions, and the uh, zenith and the nadir, as it's called, up and down and every which way in between. And that idea, of course, of the eight directions plus up and down, the 10 directions is sort of a Buddhist way of describing the all, the total, what we in English might call omni, omnivision, O-M-N-I, right? Omni, 
Well, that idea of all inclusive or omni is very much in, in part of this idea of the 10 in, in the sutra and in the Mahayana Buddhist tradition. And this sort of speaks to our Bodhisattva Akshayamati, the inexhaustible. And what kind of is being referenced here with inexhaustibility as it pertains to these 10 lists of 10 is sort of this sort of multiplication game ad infinitum. Ba -da -da -da, 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. It goes on and on and on and on and on. And that's why I would, if you're if you're out there trying to you know keep a careful list of all these, I, I'd ask you to take a step back because you might be here a while. Because <laughs> I'm sure for each of these 10, there's an additional 10, and for each of those, and so on and so on. And so again, this sort of the, the idea here is, or the the feeling of this sutra is a feeling of infinitude that this could go on forever. And indeed, I even teaching this sutra start to get the feeling that we could be here for kalpas upon kalpas upon kalpas talking about just this sutra. And it may, it may be the case actually that we're here for kalpas and kalpas talking about the sutra. Um, because again, I kind of decided last week we kind of crammed the first two paramitas into one night we basically did 20 practices, 10 for, for practices of giving or dana, And then we got into 10 uh, uh, moral discipline, shila. We got into 10 practices of shila. And so I think that might've been a bit too much to take on. And so tonight I really do wanna just try to focus on this one paramita tonight, patience or kashanti. But like I said, I want to review where we're at with all of these so that everybody has a better feeling or understanding for the 10 paramitas in total. These are, of course, what constitute the bodhisattva path, the bodhisattva practice. These paramitas are a very important part of the Mahayana Buddhist tradition. Uh, as I've said in many Dharma talks, you can find Dana, giving, moral discipline, of course, kushanti, virya, dhyana, pranya, you can find all of these in the earliest of Buddhist teachings, in the earliest of Pali suttas, you can find all these ideas. But what makes the Mahayana Bodhisattva practice, the Mahayana Bodhisattva practice, is sort of organizing these teachings in this particular way a kind of progression that begins with generosity or giving and ends with uh, jnana, what, you know, most people, including myself here, translate it as knowledge. But what we're really talking about with the 10th paramita, with, with jnana, we're talking about sarva jnana. We're talking about all knowledge. We're talking about omniscience, uh, omni, omniscience is the term for this idea of, of jnana. So it's more than just sort of being smart, it's having all knowledge. And that's what this path of the bodhisattva leads to, towards or to is the sarva jnana, the all knowledge of a Buddha of a fully enlightened being. Indeed, that is the idea of the bodhisattva, the being of enlightenment, who is, is sort of headed towards, bound for enlightenment. That's sort of the idea of that 10th paramita. And uh, like I, I, I keep saying, I'm going to summarize all of these really quickly. And the way I wanted to do that tonight, just to give everybody a flavor for all of these, so, so that when we dive into Kashanti, it'll make a little more sense. You know, the basic idea, these are these 10 virtues or qualities or pr again, practices, paramitas. They're these 10, um, you know, dharmas, another word, but these 10 ideas that the Bodhisattva is interested in. And if we look at the first one, 
the Bodhisattva is interested in making giving or dana generosity the the default mode operation in a way and so in looking at that we can very quickly flip that in our head and be like well then what would be the the non bodhisattva thing to do well that would be to be miserly and hoarding and kind of you know really really myopically focused on the self and preserving self and not really being concerned about anybody else Whereas the bodhisattva is in this sort of more altruistic mode of generosity. And those are sort of the two directions the human being can face. And it's the idea of that the bodhisattva is sort of interested in cultivating or developing these roots, the uh, roots of giving. The, the, the idea being here that this is a little seed, a little seed of generosity that we are kind of each have in a way. And when there are little sprouts of that, we can cultivate that generosity and grow deeper and deeper roots of virtue as they're called in the text. Sheila, moral discipline. Last week we were talking about things like false speech, uh, of course, acts of violence and things like that. And so when we're talking about moral discipline, the opposite of that, of course, is a certain moral laxity. <laughs> the idea that like, well, it would probably be good if I didn't commit false speech and lie, but lying is a little easier right now. So I'm just going to fall back on lying. <laughs> That's not the bodhisattva move. <laughs> the bodhisattva move is to try to be uh, in, in uh, integral, integral, right? Integrated in body, speech, and mind. And so that was a big part about moral discipline. So again, we can just kind of quickly flip these to their opposite to identify, oh, that's sort of anti-bodhisattva <laughs> anti behavior. The third one that we're gonna talk about tonight is this idea of patience. Of course, the, the flip side of patience is this idea of like lack of patience impatient, I believe is the word, this idea of, you know, quick to respond, quick to act, very impatient. Come on, come on, come on. Is this class over yet? I've got things to do. Versus patience, but it, it, patience is a little more, you know, involved in, than that. So, but again, you can kind of get a sense of the bodhisattva move and the not so bodhisattva move. Uh, we'll talk about the rest of these in, in nights to come, but quickly, virya or drive, also translated as determination. The opposite of this is a kind of laziness, a kind of apathy, a kind of lethargy. And indeed, it is a practice to be driven and determined. The, we, you know, we sort of, uh, uh, you know, as, as, as Nietzsche would say, the human being sort of walks this tightrope here. And we can quickly kind of fall off from one side to the other. And so the idea is, is that to be driven, to get us across that tightrope, that's sort of a virtue here, but we could fall into more of uh, that kind of uh, lethargy. It happens all the time. <laughs> um, meditation or dhyana, that of course is this kind of stilling of the mind versus a kind of go, 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 never resting, never stopping, even maybe to the point where you don't even want to sleep because you don't want to waste any time. That kind of idea of never resting, not such a bodhisattva move, <laughs> but that calm, peaceful state of dhyana, very much a bodhisattva move. So the bodhisattva cultivates that meditation. Pranya or wisdom, is cultivated through all kinds of education, learning, enrichment, and things like that. And the opposite of being wise is, of course, being foolish. And you can practice being foolish, just as you can practice being wise. So that's part of the idea is that the Bodhisattva strives for learning and knowledge. I would actually, just because we're not really going to talk about this tonight, I would encourage you to think about how the really defining characteristic of this knowledge or pranya wisdom in Buddhism is sort of a never, never assuming you've got it all figured out. 
a sort of an ever an ever developing curiosity and investigation of the situation is sort of in line with pranya versus a sort of settling down into some very conditioned established thought patterns yeah that's not so pranya those of course are the traditional six paramitas and the, these upper four are interesting. The first of these, the, uh, the seventh paramita here is upaya, uh, skillfulness or expedient means, skillful means. Part of, a big part of upaya or skillful means is this kind of adapting to each audience, each situation, indeed to, to even each person that you're speaking with, being very present, very responsive. The opposite, the opposite of upaya is falling back on rote, you know, uh, the same story, doesn't matter whether I just met you or you've heard it 10 times, I'm going to tell you the same story again. And this kind of idea of a sort of not really being present to the particular audience or the particular person you're talking to, but sort of being like a, a proverbial uh, butterfly in a cocoon, just sort of wrapped in your own world there. That's the opposite of upaya. And so again, upaya is this kind of responding to the moment. Bala, the, the obtaining of power. Indeed, the opposite of this is weakness. But we'll have to wait till future classes to get to the real heart of this power this particularly this Buddhist idea of bala, but we are talking about a certain feeling or sense of capability versus a kind of self-doubt, a sort of shrinking violet, as we would say, kind of a, a mentality, a defeatist mentality. That would be the opposite of bala, again, versus this sense of capacity, ability, energy, power. Number, uh, number nine here. This is the trickiest one. It's the trickiest one to translate. It's the, probably the trickiest one to explain. The Sanskrit term is pranidhana, translated as devotion, reverence, things like that. It gets even more complicated when you dive into the Chinese and you find out that the the term that the Chinese used to translate pranidana, it actually means like the will to will something to like, like that I, I would, I kind of want, it's part of um, the idea of making a vow, making a determined uh, a willful decision towards something is wrapped up in pranidana. And so, just for right now, for just because we're kind of cruising through these, when we talk about devotion in Buddhism, pranidhana, it's not a, this so, so much of an idea of being devoted to something, devoted to a, a god or god or whatever. It's not about the object of devotion. It's about the, the disposition of devotion. Like when we really commit ourselves to something, we, we often say that like, wow, he's really devoted to his practice, right? Somebody learning a musical instrument, we're like, wow, that person's really devoted to what they're doing. It's not that they worship, <laughs> right? <laughs> the whatever, you know, if you're really devoted to computer programming or really devoted to music or whatever, it's not that you worship computer programming <laughs> and music or whatever, but you're very devoted to it. That's what pranidhana sort of indicates is this, a disposition of devotion. And of course the opposite of that is sort of, well, there's a variety of things that come to mind, but right away the idea would sort of be a, like, oh, I'm gonna da I'll dabble, I'll dabble a little bit over here but not get really too into that. Then I'm gonna dabble over here and dabble over there. And I'm just gonna keep dabbling. And so I never like really commit and get devoted in that way to something. And so the idea is that the Bodhisattva 
part of the practice is sort of, you know, harnessing all this energy, all this power, and kind of bringing it all together into one will. And that's why the Chinese actually use this term yuan, this willingness, because they actually sort of talk about this I idea of pranidhana as an ability to actually like cause great change in the world if one's energy and concentration and everything is very uh, brought together, not divided with a little bit over here and a little bit over there, but actually kind of, um, uh, I want to avoid using the word concentrated because of samadhi and all that, but this idea of like bringing it all together, that's very much a pranidhana move. And then the 10th paramita again is this exalted idea of omniscience, all knowledge, sarvanyana. And I, again, I would suggest that this is kind of linked to this idea of pranya. In fact, even etymologically, pranya and jnana are related. So the idea here is, is that the all knowledge, the sarvanyana, the omniscience, is very related to pranya in that way of not ceasing the search in a way that that moment that you sort of rest on one fundamental principle in a way and say, okay, I've got it. I've got a whole world now. You have in a way been cut off from all the knowledge because you have kind of linked or clung to one particular aspect of knowledge. So in order to gain this all knowledge, we kind of have to maintain that dynamicism of upaya, that power, the devotion, all of those ideas start to work together towards omniscience. Sweet. Just a quick recap, just a quick recap of the 10 paramitas, nothing big, nothing to get too excited about. But any, any questions or comments about those before we do a deep dive into Kashanti? Anybody feeling a certain way? <laughs> cool. I mean, you know, really, this is part four. So this is really review. It's really review at this point. So everybody should probably be pretty comfortable with all these. And so let's move on to our deep dive into Kashanti. Um, again, this uh, sutra begins with a very simple question. How do you develop a mind of enlightenment? The Buddha says in verse, by way of those 10 paramitas, and then begins to do this deep dive into providing us with 10 practices or dharmas that are foremost for the bodhisattva practicing giving or practicing shila, moral discipline. And so tonight we're gonna to be talking about 10 practices dharmas, activities that the bodhisattva observes or in the language of the sutra considers foremost in the practice of kashanti. Um, let's see, I think, let me do it this way. And as many people know, I, I, I'm often uh, a little dissatisfied with this standard English translation. It often leaves a lot to be desired. Tonight is going to be one of those nights. Um, and so I've been kind of working on my own translation from the Chinese. So I'm going to be doing a little bit of back and forth. I'm actually, I, I really, I don't even think I should read this, the English, this English translation because it's so misleading in a few places. Um, yeah, it gets misleading right away. So let me, I'll just read these 10 real quick so you can get a flavor for where we're going. I'll do the classic um, uh, rule of public speaking where I tell you what I'm going to tell you about and then tell you what I'm gonna tell you about and then tell you what I told you about. I'll, I'll probably do it that way. So, <laughs> um, Virtuous one, the Buddha says to Bodhisattva Akshayamati, 
bodhisattvas practicing the paramita of kashanti, patient tolerance, regard 10 dharmas as foremost. Number one, abandoning hatred. Number two, not determining their body. Number three, not determining their life. Number four, liberative faith. Number five, maturing sentient beings. Number six, the power of compassion. Number seven, patience in being accord with the Dharma. Number eight, patience for the extremely profound Dharma. Number nine, vast, great, supreme patience. And number 10, dispelling the darkness of ignorance. These are the 10. Okay, those are the 10. In many ways, like that's the best English translation I could come up with that's true to the Chinese. The, the choices that, the, that they made, it's like, I understand why they made the choices because these are tricky, this is tricky language. Um, so I'm gonna take these one by one. If at any point anybody has ideas or questions, please just jump right in. The first one, of course, is, is pretty, it's seemingly pretty easy. Um, the number one or the first Dharma practice that the Bodhisattva considers foremost in the practice of patience is abandoning hatred, giving up hatred. So as a, as a virtue, as a, as, a, as a quality, giving up hatred seemed like, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's right. <laughs> we should definitely be working on that for sure. But how does this, how does this relate to, to patience though, tolerance, right? Or even endurance in a way. Um, so I mentioned this probably at some point in one of these, in one of these talks, the Sanskrit kashanti, the root of it is shanti. You might know shanti from the om shanti, 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 om peace, peace, peace. Indeed, shanti means peace, peace, peacefulness. Kashanti is a word that is etymologically related to shanti. And so it means a kind of peacefulness. And so, as I probably said in an earlier talk, the English word patience, which has as it at its etymological root, the pas, the Latin for peace, it's a great translation for kashanti, patience. Patience, peace, peace, that's, that's great. But what's really interesting is that how the Chinese chose to translate this. This character, uh, Ren, Ren. So this, this is a character, literally, if you were to break it down pictographically, it's a knife in the heart. Oh, <laughs> oh. And indeed, the Chinese Ren, if, if we were not in, in Buddha land, if we were not in a Buddha verse, and we were just reading a, a Chinese newspaper, the character Ren, the knife in the heart, it actually means endurance, like endure, like imagine, like you have like weight on your shoulders and you're like, oh, or you have a knife in your heart and you're like, oh, this idea of endurance. And it's interesting that the Chinese chose to translate Kashanti as this term Ren. And one of the reasons why they may have done that is that if you want to go find the, the, the origin, the like, what do the Buddhists mean by Kashanti? Like, okay, patience, is that, is that like meditation almost? Like, like being quiet and still? 
It's not, and that's where we need to kind of figure out why giving up anger and giving up hatred is a part of patience. The origin or one place to go look to find the origin of what the Buddhists mean by kashanti is this, uh, it's called, it's a Jataka tale. Jataka tales are these life stories of the Buddha before he was the Buddha. And there is a story that lifetimes and lifetimes and lifetimes and lifetimes ago, uh, when the Buddha, he was a practicing forest dwelling ascetic named uh, Megha, I believe his name is Cloud. And the story is, is that the king of Kali, Kali was this region and the Kalinga and the king of Kalinga was this very, very mean, terrible dude that for a variety of reasons that I won't get into tonight, got very angry at the ascetic named Megha and proceeded to eviscerate the ascetic Megha with a sword, cutting off each finger, cutting off the hands, cutting off the arms, cutting off all the limbs, decapitating, eviscerating the young ascetic. And the story, this particular Jataka tale of the previous life of the Buddha is to exemplify that Megha while being eviscerated by the king of Kalinga, never generated anger or animosity towards the king of Kalinga. In fact, just kept feeling utter remorse, utter compassion and kindness for the king. That's Kashanti. The patient tolerance or endurance of the world. And as I always say, every single time I give this teaching, I immediately follow it by saying, this is not a teaching about enduring abuse. This is not about enduring abuse as a virtue. No, the virtue is the heart that under assault still doesn't generate anger. That's Kashanti. And so the foremost or the first practice of Kashanti is abandoning anger and hatred that might arise when you feel assaulted in that way. Again, this is not about that it's a good thing to endure the assault. Again, this is about the good thing of not generating anger. Because of course, the idea here is if, 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 if I need to explain this, the king of Kalinga, right, is full of anger. That's his problem. <laughs> it's a problem to be full of anger. Er, ergo, therefore, the virtue here is not allowing, and I'm actually in my, in my own life, if I could speak personally for a minute, the transference of anger, because it, indeed that is really, really what happens, or at least again, personally, my experience has been this sort of, when one is being angry towards you, there is this way in which there's an absorption of that anger. And of course, you either want to give it back to that person, but if you are in some sort of disempowered situation and you can't give that anger back to that person, you're going to give it to somebody else. And then, and it kind of is a samsaric snowball of anger and Mara sitting in the corner like, yes, yes, keep doing that. And so the idea here is, is that the bodhisattva upon receiving the anger has this choice to not allow more anger to arise. And, and the other thing that I always like to add to this talk to make sure we are very clear that this is not about suffering abuse, the very idea of this actually is that anger clouds our mind 
and actually will prohibit us from finding the most skillful, wise way to not be abused and not to receive the anger. Whereas if you think about it, there's a way in which if somebody's angry towards you and then you get angry towards them, you are now in this, this ugly, angry dance together. And you're going to now be in a relationship with that person via the anger dance. <laughs> and so the idea is, is like, if you really don't want to be involved in this angry person, then don't get involved in the anger dance is another way of this, of saying this teaching. So that's the idea of abandoning anger, abandoning hatred. Questions, comments, ideas about abandoning hatred. <laughs> yeah, Kitty. There's this one story that's been coming up a few times in the Wednesday night Sangha, and that's the story of someone who was in jail for a very long time, and then they got out of jail, and they were talking to someone about it. Uh, and they said, yeah, it, it, it almost got really bad in there. And the person was like, of course it was bad. You know, you were in jail for 30 years. And he answered, yeah, I almost hated the guards. And so that's come up like a couple of times in the Wednesday night uh, group. And that just reminded me of this. Excellent. Excellent, excellent example. It's exactly what we're talking about. You know, you, you could call this sort of the moral high road or whatever in that way, but it's much deeper than that. It's much more than that. Um, and again, this is not, there, there is a, a compassionate uh, metta loving kindness aspect to it, but I, I, I kind of really want to emphasize the wisdom aspect of it here. It, yes, indeed, it's compassionate and, and fully heavy metta, heavy loving kindness to do, to not allow the anger. But again, I, I think it's also this interesting wisdom move too, that's, that's helpful to keep in mind. Okay, now we move on to number two and three, which are the probably the going to be the it's 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 why I was like oh yeah we got to spend all night just on Kashanti, because these two ideas are so interesting. Um, so first of all, it's actually why I didn't go full green screen tonight. I was going to write a little bit. It's not I haven't been writing as much. These two so. <sighs> Woo. I have I have roughly translated this. Number two is not determining the body. And number three is not determining the life or one's life. Let me read, read you the uh, standard English uh, version here. Um, so they have for number two and three, disregarding one's own body disregarding one's own life. <laughs> okay, so we're somewhere between disregarding and not determining. <laughs> uh, this is definitely a situation where I would love to have a Sanskrit version of this to refer to, to be like, wait, what are they talking about? Because without a Sanskrit version, we we are left with this Chinese character, something like that. It's a little weird to write sideways like that, but that's the character, that is the verb that's being translated by them as uh, disregard. Um, and actually the Chinese is to not do this to the body and to not do this to one's life. They, again, they have it as disregard one's body, disregard one's life. That fits in, that fits in very well with the story of the King of Kalinga eviscerating the Buddha's body and the Buddha not generating anger towards the King because the Buddha supposed, or the Megha, the previous life of the Buddha, he had no attachment to the body, no attachment to his life. That would be why they translated it the way they did it and sort of what's maybe being indicated by these two, that the bodhisattva should not be attached to the body 
not attached to their life in that way. This is, you know, it's, it gets so tricky right away. I actually, I think there's something very interesting about this Chinese character. It doesn't mean disregard the, the, the English translators. They're sort of, again, they're, they're taking the, the story of the Buddha. They know, they know, like I know that that's the reference for Kashanti. And so the Bodhisattva disregards their body, disregards their life in that way. But it's not what the Chinese means. This Chinese character means it means to calculate, it means to calculate, um, but it, it actually is, it, it means to count, but it, it, it's, it's, um, it's real meaning because there's a, f a few different words obviously for to count. So this is actually to like to total up. To, so I've translated it as determine, but it, it's like this idea of to total up and I think there's a way in which all of this fits together. And I, it's why I just wanna dance around uh, the meaning. I don't wanna say the meaning, I wanna dance around the meaning. And so one of the ideas that comes in mind with determining the body is, you know, this sort of an, like uh, analyzing the body one's body. And by analyze, of course, I mean, maybe look for faults, look for blemishes, look for illness, look for whatever. But it's this idea of sort of determining the body. Like, and, you know, for, uh, for folks who've been coming to the Dharma doors or anybody that studies with me, of course, a lot of Buddhism, old school Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, Vajrayana Buddhism, all these different forms of Buddhism, a lot of, uh, all of them have this one idea that, re, that connects them all, right? And it's this idea of no self. And of course, this idea that, that the, the fiction of our lives, the idea of like who we are and where we've come from and what we're here to do and what we're doing, you know, the story you have about yourself, that idea of a self and which again, from a Buddhist point of view, is kind of a fiction in a way that we cling to. Buddhists in general, bodhisattvas for sure, are in the business of sort of not really getting hung up in that self-identity and kind of being, you know, as a practice, trying to not be as clingy, as clingy to this at the expense of this meaning my world, everything else, my loved ones, like everything else going on outside here that, you know, whether it's the very air I'm breathing or whatever, we are inside and outside. We are intimately connected with everything that's going on around us in a very, very deep, profound way. And so again, as a wisdom move, recognizing that the clinging to this physical, this particular physical body, the obsession with it is at the expense of the rest of you. Because <laughs> again, it's not just behind the ears and behind, you know, between the ears and behind the eyes, but the clinging makes it seem that way. And then you be can become like many of us, very obsessed with this. And so I think this idea of not determining, calculating, finalizing the body, it could go all the way, it could go all the way to actually disregarding the body in that way. And not in any kind of, you know, always go back, always, always go back, please, to the first sutra, turning the Dharma wheel. <laughs> in which the Buddha outlines the middle path between self-gratification and self-mortification. So the idea of obsessing about oneself and one's beauty or what have you, that's this sort of self-gratification. The flip side of that is, is, yeah, screw it. I'm not gonna eat, I'm not gonna, yeah, whatever. The body is meaningless. 
the Buddha said, no, 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 no. Self-gratification, self-mortification. There's the, the middle path is the wise way. And so this is sort of speaking to that, again, non-obsession, non-attached to the body, but again, as a wisdom move to open you up to what is really you in terms of the more dynamic interplay with your environment. Before we get to not doing that to one's life, <laughs> Any questions or comments about this verb, this idea, this very idea of not either disregarding the body, calculating or determining the body? Michael, is not there a practice, a meditation practice in regards of um, the non-attachment to the body where you visualize the body in its like what the body really is in its, es in its essence in regards like in, in the sense of like, Imagine the, like the body with all the bacteria and all the blood vessels, like you really get into the details of, I mean, if you've ever seen a dead body, which most of us have maybe, and you, or, you know, in the surgery, then you really see <laughs> what we are clinging to. And I, um, I found for myself this, uh, this meditation really helpful um, because um, in general, we tend to uh, be attached to the body, especially in the Western world and to its outlook. And yeah, so I just want to point it out this meditation, which I personally really am enjoying. Exactly, Connie. And that's, it's been such a part of the Buddhist tradition from the beginning is this sort of deep analysis of the body and the self in that way. And so, yeah, I think that that's all kind of what this is, is tied up with, for sure. Let's, let's, let's you know, in the same breath, we're going to talk about this doing not, remember, this is in the language of not doing this to now the life. And Again, if we were going to use the uh, standard English translation, this is uh, um, the Bodhisattva uh, disregards his own life or disregards one's own life. And there is a way in the exact same way with the body that this sort of makes sense as far as the Bodhisattva not attaching to that. But there was even, there was a night, there was a night a long, a long time ago, um, where I read these beautiful poems of the the nuns of the early tradition, the the Theries, the female elders of the Theravada tradition. It's this collection of poems, these early early poems by Buddhist nuns, and I read a poem that night. I forget the name of the nun whose poem it was but it was about her, she was saying, it was this poem about another day, um, my, my begging bowl empty and uh, describing herself feeling faint and basically about to die from starvation because she hadn't, she'd come up empty in her begging bowl again. And the poem describes this beautiful realization where she says, and then I realized that I was the grain of rice falling into like the bowl of the world. And it describes this kind of liberative moment of letting go of that fear of death, ultimately, that ultimately kind of letting go um, in a way. And that's sort of what originally, of course, is built up in this is this sort of really letting go of that sense of life. But what we mean by that, I guess, from a, from a Buddhist point of view is, is, and the stuff that comes with life, <laughs> meaning death. So there's this kind of way, there's the, 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 the good news <laughs> of this practice is this sort of deathlessness by giving up this sort of idea of life. So at an extreme place, yes, this is, this is about not attaching even to my very life, let alone my body, you know, the abandoning or disregarding or not calculating the body. You could think of it as like, oh, I, I lost my thumb. 
or now I'm Michael without a thumb. And, and, and if I'm not going to calculate my body, I wouldn't compare it to before I had the thumb and this and that, it would just be what's happening in that way. So the similarly, the idea is that if this is about my body and calculating particularities of it, the not calculating one's life is the whole is the whole thing. But there's one thing that comes to mind. So when I first was translating this and I saw that the Chinese use this, this character, use this verb, I immediately had one idea that I, you know, I think is applicable in many, many ways to understand this. But when it comes to, so this little character here, which means life or lifespan, it actually means kind of destiny, but I don't want to get too, too esoteric about things. But this idea of a life or a life expectancy, when I first saw the Chinese, because I know this, again, this is a pretty standard Chinese character, it just means, again, to add things up. So when I saw that the Bodhisattva shouldn't add up their life, I immediately thought of something that I'm guilty of or whatever I do all the time. This idea of like 80, 80 would be good. If I could get to 80 years old, that would mean I'm like only just a little bit past halfway. And so that's cool that I'm, I, I got half, like that would be calculating one's life. And I actually don't think that's in any way helpful or healthy to actually do that kind of, uh, any kind of game, you know, even when we do the things of like, well, so-and-so, you know, so-and-so wrote their novel at 40. And so I can do that too. Cause I'm 40, like that, any kind of calculating of one's life in those ways. Uh, again, I think this is speaking about the Bodhisattva might not want to do that, but you know, these are, <laughs> I meant to say this actually at the, at the top of the class. Just because this is a, a decalogue, as it would be called, just because these are lists of 10, these are not thou shalt not. <laughs> this is not the 10 commandments of Buddhism or the 100 commandments of Buddhism, right? So I just wanted to make that clear. These are not thou shalt not do X, Y, or Z. This is all sort of like, you know, it's probably wiser probably wiser not to do <laughs> that. So it doesn't have such the harsh, uh, uh, the spoke Zarathustra kind of a tone to it. So I just want to say that I think part of this idea is the Bodhisattva examining those type of mental habits that limit and calculate what one's life is. Okay. Everybody good? Cool. So furthering, furthering our investigation into the Bodhisattva's practice of patient tolerance. The next thing that the Bodhisattva is interested in is these two. Um, the original English translation would be, uh, they translated as belief and understanding. And then uh, parentheses in the Dharma. Whereas it's actually just these two Chinese characters. The first one means faith, but it again, not faith in the way that uh, a theological tradition would have faith. We're again talking more about that devotion I was talking about. All, all in. I'm all in. <laughs> That's kind of the, the faith that we're talking about. And the other character actually means liberation or release through understanding this kind of like, like, oh, I got it. <laughs> and so it's kind of a tricky one to translate any which way you slice it. But it's this idea actually of a kind of a, a liberation through faith. But again, I, it's like we lack we lack words. And it's not that we lack words in English. It's just these words are all tainted. They're all tainted with, with ideas and things and uh, that I would rather not conjure up in that way. And so when we say faith, all of a sudden, you know, I don't, I don't know what you think of, but I could imagine, you know, down on your knees and like, oh, you know, and it's like, 
it's not necessarily like that in that way. So what they're talking about is this Shraddha, by the way, Shraddha is the, the, the Chinese use this character Xing, which means trust. Like, so put that together, faith and trust, right? Oh, so there you go. So um, the Chinese will use this word for a, uh, uh, like a bank, like that you trust, that you trust your money with them. You can trust, even in English. It's so funny, even like a first union trust or whatever, like we use this word in English to, it's a kind of an older, kind of early 20th century word for a bank, but a trust, but even like a trust fund, that language of trust, right? That I, I, I hey, I'm giving you my money. I can trust you, right? <laughs> I can trust you, right? So think about that. Like, I can trust you, right? Okay, I trust you. As soon as you do that, as soon as you trust, you trust me, you have faith in me, not as a God, right? Not as like, oh, now you will bow down to me because you, you trust me. No, it's that the, 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 the relationship is now one of trust, faith. That's what the Buddhists are talking about with shraddha, trust, faith, certainty. The opposite, the opposite of shraddha is doubt. But it's not, again, it's, it's not theistic doubt. It's not like, uh, I don't think God exists. I'm a doubter. It's not that. It's, if you understand what I was talking about before with trust, like, okay, I can trust her. Yeah, she's, she's good. I can trust her. I have faith in her. The opposite of that is like, I don't know. I don't know about her. I don't know if I'm going to give her my money. I don't have, I don't have faith. I don't have trust. That's the polarity, or that's what we're talking about with this term faith. So please don't anybody think again that the Buddhists have gone all theistic. It's this idea of a disposition towards, in this case, it's a disposition towards the Dharma, towards the teaching, and this idea of having faith or trust in that. But I, not blind, this is what I mean though. This is not blind faith. And so it's what I wanna just reinforce this idea of, you know, it's very interesting actually, the relationship between faith and trust, if you think about it this way, which is that when you finally, when you finally come to a point where you're like, okay, I trust, I trust this person. I could give them my child, right? I, I'm going to go, I got to, I got to leave my kid with somebody. I trust this person. That's not blind. We don't give our child blindly and say, well, I have faith. I, I really hope I get my kid back or whatever, right? The idea is, is that what faith or trust means is that you know you're going to get your kid back or whatever. So that's what we're talking about in, with this one. And that for the bodhisattva practicing patients, they have deep, liberative kind of faith or trust. And I would like to make a point about this. That's not too late. I would like to make a point about this faith or trust as it pertains to all of this. I, I mentioned this, uh, I think, uh, because trust or faith popped up. It was actually the first thing. It was the first thing on the Donna list. One of the first things that you had to... Uh, that the Bodhisattva considers foremost in practicing of giving is actually the root of faith, the root of this principle that I'm talking about, certainty, faith in this way of trusting, right? That's what the Bodhisattva for giving is, considers foremost. And, I'm, and I made this point uh, in talking about giving that it's, it's, it's like, it, you kind of do have to have a level of trust or faith because the, the at least 
uh, the Homo sapien, it seems, the this, this is is very well, actually, all creatures seem this way, frankly. They are self-preserving. That's sort of built into the wiring or built into the program of being a sentient being with sentient organs, is that you sort of protect the self at all costs, basically. And so the Buddha comes along and says, you know what, I know, I know that your conditioned response to all of this is to <laughs> cling to the self and protect it for dear life, but there's actually yeah, like plateaus of human development that you could arrive at if you wouldn't, if you wouldn't do that. If you would actually be generous, you, you could transcend being kind of a, a regular person. And there's a way in which the evolutionary, biological, self-preserved self is like, I don't know, <laughs> like, I don't know if I should do that. And so it takes a certain degree of faith or trust that being generous and not uh, self, uh, not self-preserving in that way, we all self-preserve, actually the wisdom this is the wisdom that the Buddha was expressing, by the way, that it is not against self-preservation to be generous. <laughs> it's a very narrow view of the world that thinks the only way to be safe and secure is to do this. Whereas you realize actually you're much more safer and secure if your neighbors, uh, if you've been generous towards your neighbors and therefore there's community, you're much safer. You're much safer. The person that's like got, you know, on the porch protecting their property, ironically, not as safe. So that's the part of the idea here of, of this kind of faith is that what we, what I've just said, been talking about all night, sort of not clinging to the self and the body, not even really clinging to lifespan and things like that. It takes a little bit of faith or trust to do that. Again, because we have been, you know, definitely evolutionarily and biologically, but really we've even deeply been culturally conditioned into thinking certain ways about lifespan, average expected lifespan, right? The idea that, you know, a hundred, you could make it to a hundred, buddy. You, you, you know, it's like we have these notions and so they are culturally built into us. And so it does take a degree of trust, faith to then step outside of that. So I think that's really what that one speaks to. Everybody doing good? All right. Those were kind of past, we're over the hump of like the real difficult ones, I think. Number five here, um, they, the original English translation, the, the Bodhisattva working on their tolerance or patience, they make it a practice to mature all sentient beings. Or what did I have? Uh, yeah, maturing sentient beings. It's pretty straightforward. It's a pretty straightforward idea. I probably mentioned this in a previous class of this series, but this word, this character combination, and this idea, mature or enrich, it is, it's unfortunate that in English, it is often said that the bodhisattva makes a vow to save all sentient beings. The bodhisattva does not make a vow to save all sentient beings. That term save, salvation, is a very unfortunate kind of Christian influence into the translation of Buddhist ideas. Early Buddhist translators, they really saw a kind of messiah figure in the bodhisattva and so started peppering the bodhisattva path with these like Christian ideas like salvation. What the bodhisattva does is not, not save, but mature or enrich. 
And in whatever, uh, probably part one uh, or uh, yeah, part one or two, when I was talking about this, the Bodhisattva can mature or enrich sentient beings in a variety of ways. But if you want to get a feeling for what it means to mature or enrich sentient beings, then a classic example of it is teaching. <laughs> That's to mature or enrich sentient beings, is to, to teach. That's the very idea of like public education and education in general is to enrich and cultivate and mature human beings or sentient beings or all of that. I mean, the Bodhisattva goes one step further where they want to mature all sentient beings. That's what, wow. But I just want you to know that the, the Bodhisattva does not have a savior complex, a messiah complex, and they're not out there like must save everybody. It's that the mode of behavior, and, and this th at this point, this should seem perfectly clear to you, but the mode of behavior is not about uh, maximizing my efficiency. It's not about this sort of self-cultivation. It's actually about cultivating everybody. And, you know, if it wasn't, if it wasn't so late, I would go off on this wonderful tangent about ethics and morality. And if you were to read Alain Badiou's book, Ethics, and about how ethics in the Greek tradition used to be about how what was ethical was that which raised everybody up. So like to make a beautiful piece of music that uplifted everybody's spirit, that was ethical, that was moral, because it actually lifted everybody up. And then actually through a variety of things, the ethics and morality of the West have declined. This is Badu's thesis that it has declined to where now what is ethical or moral is sort of fall or there's a baseline of morality and then we have immorality which falls below it. And it's like, come on, you got to get back up to normal. You've slipped. <laughs> That's our Western idea of ethics or morality. Baseline, good, and you aren't living up to it. But there's nowhere higher to go. <laughs> Whereas it used to be this idea that ethics was about uplifting. That's very much kind of a part of this idea of the Bodhisattva path. It's ethics, but next level ethics. Everybody good with next level ethics? <laughs> Sweet. Um, Number six here, number six is good. Um, there you go. And number six is good because this is not just compassion. And by the way, they let you down. They let you down here. So they translated it as the power of kindness, as if it were meta. It's not meta. It's compassion. It's karuna. So that's unfortunate. They're just like, eh, meta, karuna, mudita whatever, not whatever. So it's, it's uh, compassion and it is the power of compassion. And so if you were to refer back to last class, when I had all hundred dharmas written up, there were actually a bunch of powers. And if I, by the way, if I do this gesture power, it's mainly because the Chinese character is actually kind of this like arm, arm <laughs> this, that kind of gesture. So the Chinese power, Li, uh, Li, sorry. And so the power of compassion, if when I had all hundred dharmas up, there are a bunch of powers that are cultivated. The power of faith, the power of knowledge or wisdom. And this is the power of compassion. So it's not just about developing compassion. We sort of actually did that in the paramita of giving. Now we're developing this like power of compassion. And that's an interesting idea of, of like, um, well, basically like compassion as a superpower. <laughs> it is a superpower, actually. Any questions about uh, compassion as a superpower? 
classic, classic Bodhisattva move there. Okay. The next three, seven, eight, and nine, I get to do all together, which is great for expediency's sake. This is this is definitely this is this is where they they let you down the most. <laughs> this is this is where they just totally dropped the ball. And they dropped the ball because this is this is the paramita of Kashanti, right? And many of you know that there is a very special Kashanti, a very special form of patient endurance in Buddhism. And it's called the patient endurance for the birthlessness of all things. This is like an exalted state of patience. But there are actually other uh, exalted states of patience. In fact, these are three of them. But in this English translation, they just decided that you didn't, you didn't need to know that these were patiences. That's a little unfortunate. So this first one is this really interesting idea of, uh, how did I translate it? I translated it as, the patience of being in accord with the Dharma. So this is, this is a particular type of kashanti. It's a particular type of patient tolerance or patient endurance that is cultivated. And this particular type is one that sets the bodhisattva in its, this, this Chinese character is really cool but it means to flow in accord with. This is a practice of the Bodhisattva practice. Again, this is a specific type kind of patience that flows and moves in accord with the teachings or with the Dharma in that way. And this sort of is related to when I was talking about Upaya and this sort of adaptability, this sort of spontaneous adaptability, kind of being in the moment, this is very much about that idea of flowing with the Dharma in each moment and not getting uh, kind of hung up in the past that way. Um, I could say more about that, but since time's moving on and I'd like to do all these, I'm going to wrap these all together. The next one is about this kashanti, this patience for, it's basically a patience for how profound the Dharma is. <laughs> that's, that's the, the this, the, it's like, um, yeah, it's this, the bodhisattva practice of being patient or developing a patience towards profound Dharma. And I, you know, I think that there's a way myself and, you know, being a Dharma teacher, I have found myself being impatient in a way versus a more patient, slow, steady type of working and understanding of the Dharma. That's how I understand that one. But we're getting pretty far down the list. And so these are getting you know, more and more kind of exalted and as far as the practice goes. Remember the first one is just giving up hatred. <laughs> giving up hatred seems easy now <laughs> compared to what we've been through. And the ninth one is this vast, great, supreme patience. I'm pretty sure that this is kind of code for a certain kind of type of, um, you know, kashanti at its, at its finest. Kashanti full-blown is sort of the idea of this broad, vast, expansive kashanti. If I were to really want, if I were, wanted to really try to say something about this vast, broad, supreme patience, I would probably kind of, um, I, would, I would suggest thinking about all the different things we've talked about tonight 
and sort of a, a, a through line or a theme that I've sort of worked into tonight's uh, talk, which is sort of this, there's the non Bodhisattva movement, which is inward, myopic, closed off, sort of, um, you know, regarding all the paramitas, not patient, foolish, not meditative, like all of these things. And so the idea here is, is that if you, if you follow the, the movement, which is, oh, so the bodhisattva is, is generous, you know, notice the mudra, notice the gesture. It's this kind of outward flowingness. And, you know, all of these are kind of this not clinging so much here. And, you know, when we were, even when we were talking about the king of Kalinga, eviscerating your body piece by piece, but you still don't develop anger. You know, it's this sort of compassionate outward gesture. That movement, which is the non myopic, non, you know, this way, but that kind of broad, it keeps going and keeps going. The more you practice all of these, the meditation, the moral discipline, the generosity, all of these, the movement again keeps going outward and not so inward. And you, and you know, it, again, even by my, my gesticulations, what I try to, what I try to teach with my body is how, when you go in, it, it's like tight and the shoulders raise and it gets so, so uh, stressful versus this, the, the outward, it gets looser, softer, broader. And it, so if you keep, if you were following my language there, it keeps getting broad and expansive. And that's what they're talking about with this supreme, broad, vast, expansive Kashanti, right? I'm, you know, just a teacher here. So I'm, I'm interpreting, but my feeling is, is that what they're talking about is this, is, is what happens when you keep giving in that way. So that broad, expansive, supreme patience. And then finally, I'll just finish this off and that way we can um, see what has come up. L yeah, let me just talk about number 10 and then we'll see if anybody has thoughts or ideas about patience in general or this. But the last one is that the Bodhisattva, practicing the Paramita of Kshanti, the tenth thing that they consider foremost is this idea of dispelling the darkness of ignorance. That is the the tenth foremost practice. So one of the things that's interesting about this, uh, well, you know what they call this the ten teachings of ten. Where, where before last week I had the, all hundred dharmas on the board. What they call this in Buddhism is a matrika, uh, a matrix. Uh, it's where we get the word English word matrix from, is from the Sanskrit matrika, which is, I don't know if it's a Buddhist word, but I have yet to find it in pre-Buddhist writing. So it does seem like a very like Buddhist word in that way. But matrika, the mothers actually, so mater, matrika, matrix, so is worked into the word matrix is mater, mother. So the mothers is what they would call these forms of lists, right? This, um, this uh, framework of the matrika, it goes this way from giving, moral discipline, patience. But then, as I was saying at the beginning of tonight's talk, it culminates in this omniscience. The 10th paramita is sarvanyana, all knowledge. So you get this sort of progression going this way. But what gets interesting about these matrika, about these lists in Buddhism, is that they also, the same progression that's going this way goes this way too, so that each of these going down kind of correspond to the ones going this way. 
What I mean is, is that you'll, you'll begin to notice that the 10th practice of all of these is connected somehow to this idea of knowledge or all knowledge, wisdom, enlightenment. It's where this is all headed. And so this last one in this is that the Bodhisattva considers foremost dispelling the uh, darkness of ignorance. That corresponds exactly with this idea of, of all knowledge. So that's the 10th practice there. And, you know, this is sort of the, the, um, the th one of the themes of Buddhism, of course, is this idea of the darkness, the darkness of ignorance, the darkness of the afflictions and things like that. And then enlightenment, like somebody turned a light on and things that you couldn't see before, you can now see. Right? That's what happens in a, if you're in a dark room and somebody turns on a light, you can now see that which you couldn't see before. Well, that's the very kind of operating metaphor. Or one of the operating metaphors of Buddhism is that the Dharma, these teachings, are like a light that can show us things about this world that we couldn't see before. So it is a, the, a light, a light of wisdom, a light of the mind that then illuminates and understands, oh, oh, that's, oh. So that's the importance of the 10th here of dispelling the darkness of ignorance. And on that note, I'm gonna bring it to a close, ask if anybody has any epiphanies or comments, questions, ideas. Straightforward, right? All right. Well, then I can only um, give you a little taste of next week because I'm not going to dive into a whole new 10, of course. Only a fool would do such a thing. But just to let you know, a little uh, sneak preview. Next week, we're going to talk about this word, virya. Talk about this paramita of, of, well, virya is usually translated as determination. I like to translate it as drive. This is obviously going to have a lot of connections with everything we've been talking about. And in my opening, I already relate it to this idea of drive or determination as being kind of the opposite of lethargy, laziness, sloth, torpor, all those great Buddhist words. And so we're going to work on 10 practices to develop and cultivate that kind of drive. So please stay tuned for that. <laughs>
So let's see, SFDC news. Um, well, first of all, uh, I put some links in the chat. You guys know this, but you know, one thing we didn't know when we started the Dharma Collective is that typically a meditation center will have some kind of uh, endowment or trust, if you will, and then the donations kind of are um, extra, but we're different in that way. Uh, we run entirely on donations from the community. Um, and so in that way, we are a true creation of the Sangha um, and your donations uh, enable teachers like Michael and others to freely offer their teachings. Uh, and that model, you know, it only works if people donate. So there are some links in the chat. And if you can give freely, please do. And if you can't, don't, but keep coming. Uh, we want to create a place where we can all share uh, in the Dharma together. And then I also put a link in the chat to the YouTube video of the um, the time in Dharma Doors, if you weren't there, where Michael read it from that book of poetry. It's a really beautiful oh, um, awesome. hour and a half. I cried like at least once. Um, <laughs> I think you did too. I did. I did. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was very moving. Uh, so if you haven't seen it, you know, get some tea and some tissues and tune in. Um, and if you go to that video, there's also a playlist of all the uh, other videos. So if you've missed one, you know, I mean, you don't want to miss the uh, Paramita of Sila. So you go back and watch that. Um, and then finally, no, not finally, two things. One is that if you have um, friends who do not practice, but who might want to learn, we have a few beginner friendly things. And 2020 is a good year to start a meditation practice. Uh, so we have a morning <clears throat> sit on weekday mornings at 830 Pacific. That's just uh, it's like a 15 minute guided sit with some Q&A time uh, before and after. So that's a really good way to start. And uh, we also have coming up next Saturday at five o'clock, we have a Q Sangha. And that is for anyone who's LGBTQIA plus and allies uh, to meet and practice together and also have community. Um, and so if you have a friend who's looking for a place to practice in that kind of community, or if you want to practice in that kind of community, check out Kyusanga. Uh, it's a growing community here in the Dharma Collective. And then finally, um, mm -hmm. we're starting to look into a new space and we are not, we're being, <laughs> we are being very patient about it. Uh, it's not safe to reopen now. We don't think, but we're starting to kind of turn our attention that way. And if you haven't seen this yet, we want to hear from you about how safe you feel, what you would like in a new space, what you would not like, what's your kind of ideal meditation space. Uh, so if you want to kind of dream big, there's a space to fill that in. And we really want to know what the wants and needs of the Sangha are before we just kind of go, you know, charging at a new, a new space. And it will be a while, you know, we're going to be here on Zoom being patient for a while, but we're just starting to think about it. And if you have thoughts, the this survey that I just put in the chat, it should take between like three to five minutes to take and make your voice heard, you know, let us know um, what you're looking for. Okay, all that said, uh, there, uh, Michael, do you have anything else to update people on? No? Uh, that's it for me. I'll be okay. back next Sunday. Looking forward to it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, yeah. for being here. Thank Thanks, you. Everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.